Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on this panel. I am very excited to chat to you all today. Uh, just before we start today's panel, I just want to say to everyone watching this, um, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat box and we'll answer them uh, as we go through. Uh, but for now, it's just going to be all, us three just having a chat and talking about the world of gaming and communities within that. So before I introduce today's show and what we're going to talk about, I'd like to introduce the guests. Uh, we have two fantastic guests who are alongside me. We have Roham and Sebastian. Uh, I'd love for you guys to very quickly maybe uh, introduce yourselves, hey, say hi to the audience uh, before we start. So maybe we go Roham and then we go Sebastian. Sure. I'm Roham Garagos Lu, CEO of Dapper Labs, the company behind CryptoKitties, NBA Top Shot, and the Flow Blockchain, which uh, all of our projects are based on. Fantastic. And Sebastian? Hi, I'm Sebastian. I'm the CEO and co-founder of The Sandbox, a decentralized virtual gaming platform where players, creators can make 3D voxel assets and game experience and monetize them through the use of blockchain, non-fungible tokens, and our cryptocurrency sand. Fantastic, fantastic. Both amazing guests and both with a unique aspect of gaming and community. So very excited for this conversation. Cool. So I want to start off with an abstract or kind of a high level introduction of this conversation. So if you're not aware of the title of this talk, it is Gaming Communities of the Future. And so we will be talking about everything that is around gaming and communities and how this will evolve with this new uh, blockchain computing platform shift and all of this cool stuff. So I just want to start off by saying, um, you know, crypto and gaming has a lot in common and some people may not know that right um and there's a funny story that i always like to say which is um you know arguably ethereum as as a computing platform wouldn't exist if it weren't for uh vitalik and him playing world of warcraft so uh for those of you who don't know the backstory i'm sure i get uh, our, our um our panelists know exactly what i'm talking about here but uh for those of you who don't uh, Vitalik was playing World of Warcraft back in 2017 to 2010. Uh, you know, he loved the game. It was a fantastic game. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the, game, the game developer, Blizzard, uh, removed uh, what, what he calls the damage component from his beloved Warlock um, uh, character. Uh, and, and, you know, he was, un he was unfortunately very angry about that and very upset. And that kind of, you know, according to him, uh, gave him the inspiration to start Ethereum and kind of kick off this revolution. So um, that being said, there's a lot of parallels between, you know, what's going on in the gaming community and what's going on in crypto. And so I'm excited to chat about today's uh, topic. So um, just a kind of general structure of the things that we're going to chat about in today's, in today's uh, conversation. So we're going to cover, uh, you know, like I said, um, blockchain gaming communities uh, and the incentives that are kind of in these communities and, and how folks, uh, how you're able to keep everyone aligned in terms of, uh, you know, um, creating a collaborative community. Um, then uh, we're going to talk about, you know, what perfect alignment is, because, you know, there's a lot of thoughts around, you know, what a perfect gaming community looks like, or what, I, I guess what an ideal gaming community looks like when the incentives are aligned uh, between gamers, uh, you know, uh, developers and, and things like this. Um, and, you know, we're going to have a conversation around how we can achieve this. So uh, we've done the intros, we've done the high level. Uh, so let's jump into the first topic. Um, my first question is um, around um, gaming communities and how, how you see them right now and how you foresee them kind of in the future, right? I know I've uh, spoken to Sebastian about this quite a lot. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts and then maybe Roham, you can uh, chip in and talk, talk to us about that. Right. Well, uh, I like to say that essentially in the gaming industry, all the game developers, all the games are essentially behaving as closed wall garden economies where the players are more considered by the developer as just uh, a one way relationship where developers provide services, they provide some entertainment that the players can consume, usually for free in a free to play business model. but. They can get a little bit enhanced user experience uh, and potentially fun by consuming through in-app purchases, buying either virtual items or specific paths, etc. That will give them a slightly better experience. So in that one-way um, uh, relationship between players and developers, uh, essentially uh, it's an economy called free-to-play that's fully supported only by a small portion of users who are spending like three one percent three percent sometimes five percent depending on the kind of games and still the video game industry which has 
2.6 billion gamers, so it's been growing largely uh, with free to play and, and it represents over $160 billion in the three uh, as of late uh, this year number. And everyone seems to be happy with that situation, except, well, uh, except a few uh, companies who've been really pushing for a new model, a more decentralized model where this could be much better, a, a much better relationship between the players and the game creators could exist. And, and this is a little bit the backstory of my own project Sandbox. Like we started in 2012 developing a mobile game on iOS and Android, which has been downloaded over 40 million times where all players could play with a lot of different uh, 2G elements to create their own games uh, and share them to an online gallery. But all of that, all that creativity, all that energy they spent, uh, but it was centralized. So there was no way for us through the platform to offer an experience where the, the investment in time, the dedication they put, all the craft they did, they could actually take some potential return, reward for it, except into the virtual currency and the limits of the platform. So when we saw uh, at the late of 2017, crypto pitches, uh, being born and, and rising, and, and, and it, it immediately struck us with the potential of like, wow, uh, not only players can own their digital assets, their virtual items turning into digital assets from other developers, but potentially if we combine that technology with user-generated content, we could create something like a really strongly new, a new value offering where it's, um, there is a value of what you create that you can take with you, that you can own finally, and you can monetize in many diverse ways in a more, much more open economy system where all your content could go outside of the platform where you created that content. And so as such, you can monetize it in new ways. And as we evolve that idea, that concept of UGC combined to NFTs, we are now seeing uh, communities, uh, which we can say blockchain gaming communities, really getting deeply involved together with the developer, participating um, with the developers uh, into the economy and the value accretion and uh, the promotion of the game that and platform they get engaged with. So I think it's, it's bringing really an opportunity to, to set a new kind of relationship between uh, all the parties that are involved with a game or a platform and mutually benefited between the developer and uh, the users, the players who are part of this um, community. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And you mentioned there about, you know, digital scarcity being the enabler of that. And, you know, who better to speak to that than Roham, who obviously pioneered the popular game uh, CryptoKitty. So maybe Roham, do you have any uh, views on what Sebastian just said there? Yeah, for sure. And I, I think Sebastian hit the nail on the head. And, you know, some of the things we talk about uh, at Dapper Labs all the time is, you know, communities have always existed and the communities exist digitally today. Uh, but every digital community, whether it's a game or Facebook or Instagram, whatever it is, um, the, the users are, are users. They're subjects. They're not citizens. They don't have any rights inside the community that they participate in. When they buy stuff, they don't actually own it. They're being sort of granted it by the, by the um, sort of whims of the rulers of that particular um, uh, environment. So, so blockchain is really the first time you can sort of change that relationship, right? And when we saw Bitcoin, yeah, at my previous company, Axiom Zen, we started working with crypto back in 2014. And the idea was, well, if people can own their money, why can't they own other digital things? Um, and, you know, it took us until 2017 to, to sort of work on the non-fungible token standard and then, and then, then CryptoKitties. Uh, but it was this idea that most of the things we love in life are actually non-fungible, right? Your home, your art, your pets, your family, your data. Um, and, and if you can own your money, then why can't you, why can't you have uh, a full ownership over, over everything else? Um, and the effect of that is that creators and consumers come closer together. So I love the work that Sandbox is doing with UGC. The effect of that is that fans and brands can connect directly. That's why the NBA is interested in blockchain. That's why folks like Warner Music uh, are interested in blockchain. Uh, and then fans can connect directly, right? They, they can be peer to peer in a way that doesn't, in, instead of being on one digital middleman, you know, one social network like Facebook, CryptoKitties can exist in every single blockchain wallet out there, hundreds of them, uh, maybe thousands at this point, um, every single virtual world from Sandbox to Decentraland to, to CryptoVoxels. 
and it's the customer that decides what they want to do uh, with the things that they've, they've paid for. So I think that's really, really powerful. Um, but kind of viewed from a business context, what's, what is gaming today? It's basically uh, outside of blockchain. It's this war for, uh, to squeeze as much LTV as you can out of a small group of people so you can spend as much money as you can acquiring more people. Uh, and you just like churn people through that funnel. And, and you know, there's, there's, gotta be, there's gotta be a better way. Um, and, and crypto in a sense flips it on its head, right? Because people can sell the stuff they buy. It's much lower acquisition cost to get the, that sort of first cohort in. And they're often early adopters. They're often people that wanna contribute and work with the developer because they benefit financially. They, they're interested, they're active, they're involved, they're, they evangelize. That creates virality. It further reduces your, your customer acquisition costs. Um, and because people are in, they have skin in the game, they know they own the thing forever, right? They can give it to their kids if they want to. Um, and they know whether or not the game developer is even around. Um, all of the things they were promised, they've already received. Um, and so the, they, they're much more likely, we've seen CryptoKitties to come back over and over again. Uh, you know, CryptoKitties was a one year game. It's now sort of two and a half years later, or rather it had a one year of gen generation zero cats being released. But now it's two and a half years later, we still have 6,000 MAU on top of Ethereum, a very expensive network to operate on. Um, and, uh, and people are spending you know, real money engaging with each other and, uh, and around these digital assets. So, so it's quite, quite powerful. The one thing we didn't talk about though is sort of what happens after they're created. And, and that's the coolest thing for me in the sense that you know, today you download an app, you buy digital assets, those digital assets always stay in that. And on the blockchain, you buy the digital asset and then any developer can build apps for that digital asset. Uh, and, and especially as these you know, more scalable blockchains come online, you'll start being able to support many more developers creating content for many more uh, users. Um, and I think that that's gonna be the real sort of you know, snowball uh, uh, effect. And, and, and the moment that crypto as a technology crosses the chasm, not just crypto gaming, uh, but, but crypto because you know, cryptocurrencies have been around for 11, 12 years. Everyone who's interested in speculating on cryptocurrencies is already speculating on cryptocurrencies. We got to give uh, a different reason for people to engage with, with decentralization because I think we're all here because we believe it's bigger than just sort of uh, ticker, ticker symbols on a, uh, you know, on a cryptocurrency exchange. So that's my piece. Yeah, and I, and I couldn't agree more. It's a fantastic take from both of you around. Uh, you know, you, you both kind of alluded to it there, whereas, Ran, uh, you know, what the current gaming industry is about is about increasing the LTV and, and kind of using that to get more gamers and then kind of f complete, completely kind of spin that funnel around and, and get, you know, this perpetual cycle going, right? Where um, with this new computing platform, we can kind of flip this model on its head um, and, and, and just share the pie a bit more, right? Where you kind of, um, you're, you're aligning incentives and you're, you're, you're creating like real value here that everyone can kind of participate in, right? Um, and one example there is like you say with, um, uh, uh, crypto kitties how you know it's still around and people still to this day are, are using it you know uh playing around with it because there's you know it, it's not it's not like a regular game where you just you're playing it and and you know you, you occasionally buy some in-game items and then that's it um you know you have real stake and real ownership in this uh in this community right which is which is pretty cool um and that kind of leads me on to my next question which is around um uh, you know, I was I was kind of researching up uh, uh, before we we had this uh, conversation, um, and there was a really cool A16Z talk um, that I came across. Um, and you know, at the end of the talk, um, uh, the the chap was talking about you know how the future could be around you know there's a particular game, uh, and then you have uh, let's say for example in game eBay where uh, you can trade skins, um, or uh, an in game Etsy where you can have a creative that can uh, make really cool skins and sell them to gamers in a game. Or you could have an in-game task rabbit where uh, you can essentially hire another player to to help you achieve a particular thing in a game. Um, you know, we've all kind of alluded to it here um, in terms of like the extensibility of games and how you can create this real economy around them, which I think is a fascinating idea. Um, what do you guys think is missing um, from for, from from where we are right now to to get to that utopia? What kind of tech is missing? What are the missing blocks that you think we need? Uh, to to make this a reality, and this is free for anyone to jump into. Uh, I mean, you know, for, for, uh, I, I can go first, given that it's uh, it's what I think we've been working on for for what feels like a decade, but has only really been uh, a year and a half. And it's and it's not just scale, right? Everybody talks about scale and throughput and speed and transactions per second, uh, but of course you need that. 
Um, and you need to bring costs down to a level that allows free to play, that allows people to try before they buy, because that's just what we as humans expect now from, from digital worlds. Um, so that's important. Um, but the user experience I feel is, is by far the most important because every crypto, most, almost every crypto application to date has said, hey, welcome, I'm a crypto application, buy crypto to engage with me. Um, and that's, I think, the absolute wrong way to put it, right? That's like going to a, you know, going to, to Amazon and have Amazon say, hey, I'm an SSL application, you know, go download this you know, security package and learn about uh, uh, sort of digital certificates in order to, to buy, something, buy, buy a book from me. Um, and I think that that's why games are powerful, right? Because they, there's a point to it and it's the technology is just the enabler of the vision that the creative director wants to sort of give to, to, to uh, her, her audience. So, um, so yeah, I, 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 think that, I think the user experience is really important and letting people experience these things rather than sort of spelling them out um, for them, uh, making the payments, all of these things feel familiar, right? Something shouldn't take two minutes if it does you should tell me what the hell's going on and, and your error messages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but which brings us to the third thing, which is developer experience. Because you can look at Ethereum and say, oh, you know, crypto sucks because no one's built usable applications. Um, but the reality is it's very, very hard to do things like, uh, do, do the things that you, you provide the kind of user experience that I think mainstream consumers expect um, on top of um, a platform that wasn't necess that wasn't enabled wasn't built to enable consumer applications as its sort of core purpose. Um, and so, you, you know, Abel, you and I talked about this briefly on, on, your, on your, your, your podcast, but, you know, how do you do uh, without the protocol allowing things like human readable security where the wallet needs to understand what am I asking permissions for to my user? You just can't do that. And so how do you, how do you, how do you, um, how do you bridge that gap as a developer? We built Dapper Wallet, you know, still the, the biggest, most popular smart contract wallet on Ethereum, um, you know, to try to solve the gas, gas fee problem, right? So you have, we have subscriptions for gas where you can buy uh, transaction passes, or if you're part of our partner network, we just pay uh, the gas kind of like Amazon Prime. But it's, it's just nuts because gas is such an unpredictable uh, thing. You know, the, the model, the way it's set up where people are bidding to get ahead of each other the unpredictability of me not even knowing, is my transaction going to go through or not? It's just going to sit there in the mempool forever. How do you build around that as a developer? It's, it's very challenging. And so, so I think it's all three things, you know, scale, which a lot of people are working on, user experience, which a fair number of people are working on, and, and the developer experience to build usable applications, which I feel like nobody is working on, um, because everyone that's building developer tools is building developer tools and not sort of trying to use those developer tools. So, I don't know, Sebastian, you probably have a less, uh, uh, you know, a, a more impartial view on this. So I'm curious to, to hear, hear your perspective as, you know, someone building but, great useful applications, but, you know. Uh, I, I agree with you to some extent. Like, I think I would maybe reorder those things. Uh, like, for me, at the very first, is what, what is the user experience you, you're providing with your application or your game? Uh, not the user experience of the onboarding on the wallet, but more like, we are in an industry, gaming, where it's mostly about entertainment. So we have the chance to build products that should be fun, that should attract players to actually enter your game, engage with them. And the moment where the, the, the players want, uh, want this, they see this nice trailer, they say, oh, this is great, this is a game I, I want to play, I want to start spending hours into this, delving into that, and potentially make a decision of buying a content, whether it's centralized via yeah, in-app purchase or decentralized, yeah, well, uh, going through all the blockchain, NFTs, and, uh, and all the steps there. And, and um, the, the moment of time where I'm convinced by the gameplay, it's fun, I want to start engaging further, spending potentially, should be potentially uh, at a later stage of the experience, not necessarily the first thing that you have to do to enter into the game. And that's something uh, important that sometimes, because um, by, for many reasons, people have tend to focus only on the technology rather than on build, what, what is the product, what is the value proposition I'm giving to my users. They tend to forget about that. Let's build a great game first and then think like how more naturally the users will want to go through the more difficult steps because they are already engaged and they want to consume the experience with you. This is something we are seeing with Sandbox, uh, and now uh, 
Uh, there, there's really a strong demand, even though Sandbox is not fully launched. Uh, we have been running pre-sale of FFT, which is something also very powerful to create community of users. Like your, it enables you to uh, onboard users as part of your community, make them ambassador, make them by stakeholders of the success of your project, even before the, the project is actually fully launched to the public. And uh, because they are so excited about what we are doing, that some of them have gone through the extent of uh, going to understand what is a wallet, running through the transaction, and sometimes, unfortunately, having to face some of the issues you described, like high gas fees to, and racing condition for who will get the land first, specifically when those have been selling in just a couple of minutes. But um, there's also something I, I wanted to uh, to bring, uh, uh, like uh, as a game developer, uh, sometimes you, you cannot reinvent all the, the wheel and everything in the ecosystem all by yourself. So this is really amazing that over the past two years, two years and a half, even though we are in a quite young industry, there's been actors that have uh, worked hard and focused on improving some of the chaining and the tool sets for uh, us developers to build a better user experience. And indeed, by you, Dapper Lab, you've developed this uh, uh, Dapper Wallet, which is much more user friendly than what the other solution on the market uh, have been proposing to date. And now you're focusing also on uh, offering a blockchain solution that's uh, going to solve some of the solution that we are facing as developer. So it, it's great that we can also rely on partners that that decided to focus on that part so we can just focus on the other part, the fun. So that's um, to me that, like essentially what game companies, uh, most the majority of game companies, they don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel every time. They just need to trust a strong developer ecosystem and, and, and use good solution for that. I, I completely agree with uh, both your viewpoints on this. And I think, I think you're totally right. And I, I don't want to just kind of limit this to the world of gaming, but I would actually uh, bring this one level higher and just say any application uh, that's using this novel technology that is blockchain should think about application first and then think about tech as a means to getting to that thing, right? In, in gaming, it's like, how can I create the best game possible? And how can I use the, uh, the unique aspects of this tech to, to make that best game? Not the other way around is how can I kind of make this awesome piece of tech and then kind of try to bring people to make cool games with it. It's, it should be, you know, like you guys say, the other way around where it's like, how can I build the best thing uh, and, and kind of focus on that? And, and I love that mindset. And it's definitely shines through in, in both of uh, what you guys are doing and, and kind of uh, your sentiment here, which is, which is awesome. Um, I want to kind of switch back into the world of, um, economies and business models and all of this cool stuff because um i i was i was again like i said i was doing i was doing some research before we had this conversation and i was like um looking up on you know if i'm a person right now in the world of gaming how how can i make money how can i how can i make a living by doing what i love which is you know actually participating in, in different communities right so um i broke it down into three things right so First is you make the game, obviously. You're a game developer. Uh, you, you work really hard. You, you, you make some fantastic game. You put it out there. Um, and then if it's a hit, congratulations, you have a business. Um, if it's not, you crack on and you make another game and you try to make that hit, right? Uh, the second thing is esports, right? You know, being an esports player or a professional uh, player within a game, uh, that is like a really common uh, thing that's coming up now. I'm, I think esports is kind of, you know, growing in an exponential rate and at some point will kind of be at the level as, as you know any other sport and be respected as, as such um and then there's youtubers and streamers right um you know i'm thinking like uh, ninja pewdiepie uh those kind of folks um but if you kind of go through all of those options to make money uh you know i spoke about how it's really hard to make games and make them a hit uh you know esports teams uh, I found out that, you know, League of Legends has 100 million uh, active users, right? That's a lot. Uh, but it's only 100, it's only, uh, it's under 1,000 players uh, that are actually pro uh, in the game, uh, which is like not, uh, 0.001%, which is crazy, <laughs> uh, which shows you that, you know, in some cases, it's it's harder to, to be a pro in these games than it is to be a pro in an actual sport, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, American football, soccer, you, you name it, right? Um, and then, for example, YouTubers and streamers, right? You know, there's a hundred, uh, sorry, not a hundred, uh, three million active streamers per month uh, on Twitch, um, but only 10K are on the uh, the partner program. That's where they actually get to make money, right? Um, 
and that's what it looks like right now for uh, the world of gaming, right? There's not that many opportunities to make money. Um, and I wonder, you know, I wonder, you know, how 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 we're gonna how we're gonna enable this? We we touched on this earlier in the conversation, but you know, three things I came across that were interesting is you know, digital ownership, uh, digital scarcity, uh, provenance, and you know, these new economic markets, right? So um, my question ar- ar- around this particular topic is, um, you know, as well as digital ownership and digital scarcity, provenance, and these new economic markets, um, how else do you think will enable more? people in the gaming communities to be able to make a living by partaking in these uh, uh, in these new kind of uh, gaming communities of the future. And that's for anyone to take. <laughs> Maybe I can start on this one. No. So uh, more specifically to Sandbox, it's um, we can easily draw a comparison with virtual worlds. And um, in virtual worlds, um, like many comes to mind, like Second Life, World of Warcraft, or even games like you mentioned, League of Legends to some extent, more recently Animal Crossing. In all those v- virtual worlds where there's like large amount of players that's been, we've seen like quite organically um, new business, new economies develop outside of what the developer of those games originally intended to. Like we've seen people starting to make guild, organize price competition. We've seen people starting to trade the virtual goods that they earned inside those games and using because those are centralized games not on the blockchain they were using i would say like gray or black market where they could switch accounts or uh, try to, to trade in a way that sometimes the developers have allowed via the marketplace sometimes via the uh, other way that's not been allowed and, and unfortunately what the story has told us with all those games is that um usually the centralized developers who are operating those virtual world are quite against uh, enabling new opportunity for their users, for their members to earn money in ways that they didn't design. So it goes against the term of service and what is the most stupid reaction in the world they would do is they would go and they would chase after the users who are doing that to try to punish them, to remove their license, to take off all their content creation or uh, items. and. Uh, I, I'm not inventing it. Like if you start Googling, you can see all those stories about users who lost their account, etc. And I think it's it's massively stupid decision because you have like people who naturally figure out a new way to monetize, to earn from an economic system, uh, from a system that, and instead of like um, working smartly to make it thrive, enable it, and potentially see how big the potential could be. Like they always try to shut it down and control everything. So that is a major paradigm shift that uh, play to earn is also that it's the new business model that characterizes what the, the situation where players, instead of just spending in the game, are actually also spending time to actually try to earn something, usually a financial interest. Um, that's what I've been describing. And I think we should specifically decentralized games and decentralized virtual worlds should embrace and enable even further. So, so that's what we're working uh, with in Sandbox, putting in place some sort of circular economy that enables uh, on one side, the user who want to build stuff and spend to acquire that stuff from other users who are willing to give uh, something else of value in exchange, like their time, for example, to monetize and trade virtual, uh, the, the NFTs or other resource and tokens in the platform. So all of them are incentivized in a way to participate in the platform and for their own interest. Um, So play to earn, essentially it's an emergent business model. I'm not saying that um, it will shut down or kill free to play or even premium. Like those two will still largely exist, but there is an alternative that exists. This alternative is growing. So in front of games like Minecraft, that's Roblox, than uh, the large MMO, players can also begin earning uh, professionally or not. We don't need to be like a pro gamer only to win and to earn uh, thanks to decentralized gaming and blockchain technology. Yeah, I, I agree with that perspective. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, the, 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 the only kind of caveat or the only thing I would add to it is I wouldn't be too hard on the centralized game companies for, for sort of not adopting an open economy or, or put, trying to put these capital controls is really what they are, right? If you think in a macroeconomic context, 
um, is that their economies will break if they allow open, uh, open sort of, in, if they release the capital controls. Um, and, and, you know, what, what Sebastian's talking about isn't, you know, one or two people. It's billions of dollars every year, lots of it uh, uh, cause, uh, being, um, uh, I think it's over 30% that, that is uh, subject to fraud and whatnot. So it's, it's despite the high level of fraud, people still try to go through these hoops. So people, the, the gamers want to do it. The game companies don't know how to enable them. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's, that's the paradigm shift that I, that I agree we're, we're sort of going through. Um, what we found, uh, especially in terms of sort of helping established gaming companies wrap their head around it is you got to think about the, the game design in a different way and play to earn, you know, the immediate implication is that I'm going to play a free to play game and I'm going to earn things of monetary value. And, and you can imagine how that can get kind of unwieldy quickly, right? Like if I can just tap on a button and get money, then what's stopping me from having, you know, a thousand phones in parallel tapping on buttons, you know, earning money. Um, so I like to think about it. And you guys really alluded to this, but, but, but the framework I use is it's got to be a value exchange. You got to be doing something that's valuable to someone else in the virtual economy. Um, and so, and so they, they're, they got to be willing to pay for it, whether pay for it through um, sitting on their assets, whether pay for it through, uh, purchasing them off of you, whether pay for it through other other means of value exchange. So I guess some examples are just, you know, resellers in NFT economies, right? We talked about the pre-sales. Resellers will come in, buy a bunch of stuff, and then help the community understand, hey, what's, how to complete sets? What's the, um, sort of how, to, how, to, how does the game even work? And, and they provide that sort of liquidity, both in terms of financial um, and in terms of uh, uh, sort of knowledge and, and, and learnings and, and whatnot. Um, in CryptoKitties, we have, you know, auto birthers where to be kind of decentralized, we, we publish a thing on the blockchain and provide an incentive um, for, for others to, to claim the birthing revenue. Uh, we do it ourselves as well, but we have a, a, a network of others to sort of show that even if Dapper Lab goes away, there's an there's a incentive for, uh, for people to continue uh, birthing cats because on Ethereum, and this is another developer experience thing, smart contracts can't just autonomously do things. They need to be called... And and uh, I'm told uh, uh, and, and sort of been given a, a command to in order to act. Um, you know, I guess you know we we already talked about UGC artists, right? If I create content that someone else wants and they pay me, well, that that's a great way to play to earn. Um, if I curate content for somebody else, you know, Avastars is a really cool project on on Ethereum where um, every single avatar is on chain, uh, but there's there's you know so many different combinations. So people take the time to just go through figure out the really cool looking ones. So they're curating content. They pay the on-chain fee to actually mint the, the thing, and then they can sell it on OpenSea, uh, et cetera. Um, and so in that way, the curator is, is making money um, by providing a service, curation, right? And you know, in the case of esports, it's entertainment. You know, you're doing something that someone else values and they, and they, they, they support you. But in today's esports environment, you gotta be big enough where you have advertising and you have, you have to have that sort of clout, right? Endorsements, that's sort of the business model. Whereas on crypto, it can be just direct peer to peer. You can, you, you, I like the way you play. You're a little bit better than me. You teach me how to get better. I support you either buying your collectibles because I believe in you're going to be a big star in the future. So I, I want to be part of your community. Um, and sort of it becomes kind of Patreon exponential. Um, and so those are the kinds of projects I get super excited about, like other than games as well, is, you know, things that are adjacent, but that can also just be, they're not, it's, it's not just in a virtual world. It can then also apply to, your friend groups and your the causes you care about the the, the companies you choose to work with um all, all of this stuff yeah i i definitely agree and it, it's a future i get excited about uh not just in the gaming space but just in every kind of aspect you can possibly imagine right this this technology allows for uh you know ownership to be easily distributed and, and, and given out and, and, and managed. Uh, and, and that can open up so much more economic opportunity. And, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation to have. And, you know, I'm excited to see uh, what this looks like um, in the future. So um, I realized we're up at the 30 minute mark. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to the folks in the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, just make sure to uh, pop the questions in the chat and we'll be able to answer them as we, as we kind of see them. Uh, 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 as we go on. So uh, that's the halfway mark, but um, I'm going to continue asking questions uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the show. So um, one question I do have is around, um, I guess we, we, kind of, we kind of alluded to it earlier on where we spoke about, you know, uh, what are the kind of limitations, but um, past that conversation, um, 
you know, we discussed all these really amazing things that can happen if we enable uh, uh, these new technologies and what they can do for, for ownership and, 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 you know, different incentive alignments and stuff like that within these communities, right? Um, within the near horizon what are you guys like really excited about like what do you think um if you if anyone in the audience if you were to point anyone in the audience right now to go check out this project or to go check out this idea um around how to empower uh, gaming communities in the future what what would that be like what would you say oh go check that out um maybe we start off with sebastian and then we go to rohan well i think with uh, just the nfts we have surfaced the, the first layer of what is possible to do with them is essentially like yes i can own them maybe i can participate in creating them and give them utility either in one uh, game or one platform uh, for example a sandbox and its game maker but potentially uh, any other developer can use them and interoperability is uh, one of the nearest promised use case that that should give more value to each of those game assets and allow the players to reuse them, potentially increase the value by playing across different games is really exciting. I think NFTs beyond that also enable more things like by essentially uh, they can work as access pass to specific game or entering special, specific uh, DAOs, for example, decentralized organization where you can enter a specific group of people by proving that you own those different digital asset and in a way identify yourself uh, that way. We've seen things like fractional ownership, which I think uh, becomes or can become also interesting. And specifically as some NFTs are uh, large, uh, large value, like five figures, six figures. So they become not necessarily accessible to a single individual, but they could be owned uh, by a group of people uh, who participate and then potentially can rent it or can use it in a way and split the dividends from uh, by leveraging the this NFT into different games uh, and the earnings, it, the earnings it will generate. More immediately, there's things uh, happening already within the Sandbox virtual world where we've been uh, empowering literally hundreds of artists to create those 3D voxel assets and monetize them through our marketplace. And now we're starting to see a new generation of uh, artists who are starting to think, I'm going to create this sort of like digital fashion where it's uh, like a uh, skin or outfit for avatars. And I want, I not only want this uh, skin or outfit of, for an avatar in Sandbox, but I want it to work as well in uh, uh, crypto voxel, Somnium space, Decentraland, and potentially all the other virtual worlds on the blockchain. And I find this idea really exciting, very compelling that we can have people who are going to work on demand of selling their art, selling their craft, and knowing that this uh, content can be used across all the, across several actual live platforms by many users. I've seen this not only for skins and outfits, I'm now seeing it with, for example, 3D cars. So um, there's a company called Crypto Motors that does that. Um, and it's just the surface, like we're just only now beginning to imagine uh, more uh, more ways to monetize content, more ways to build services on top of these NFTs and our platform. I can literally imagine uh, like uh, giving my NFTs to another player who will like train them on my, for me and level them up and potentially earn some money on my behalf. Like just really, uh, we had the keys and now we are going, we only need like people to come with creative ideas to leverage those content and provide extra value service uh, based on potential yield, potential uh, revenue incentive behind. Yeah, that's a that's a really great answer. Um, I'll, I guess I'll um, I'll give maybe a quick sort of six step guide to what I think is is, is super interesting in NFTs and crypto. Uh, and they're not necessarily sort of value judgments on the steps, but I would start with, you know, pure collectibles. So CryptoPunks is the original. Uh, crypto art is, I think, just tearing right now and, and very, very, a very cool sort of burgeoning community to look at in, in Ethereum. Um, level two or stage two is sort of crypt collectible games. Uh, you know, CryptoKitties is uh, my favorite for, for, for obvious reasons, but there are, there are some others that are, that are really fun. Um, step three for us has been collectibles, a collectible, a sort of a collectible outer loop, but a uh, mainstream friendly inner loop. And 
really all mobile games are this, right? That you, you come in, you do something that's, that's uh, um, sort of more active, and then your, your brain is working on sort of the strategy of the, of the outer loop and the, uh, the, the, piece, the, the pieces, you, your work you need to do to kind of uh, progress. Um, that's kind of what we're doing with NBA Top Shot. And um, it's by the time I think this will be live, you should be able to go on NBA Top Shot, uh, sign up, and then with quick, with reasonably quickly get in. We're still in the, in the private, private stage, but it's going really, really well. Um, uh, and then I think there's, there's things like uh, Sandbox and, and sort of where you're, uh, well, actually, before you go to the metaverse, there's very extensible, um, there's, a, there's a category that I think hasn't been uh, explored properly yet. Cheese Wizards were sort of our first attempt at doing it, uh, but, but because of the difficulties of Ethereum, we couldn't really <laughs> get there. Um, and it's the idea of a fully on-chain game where it's the assets, the gameplay, everything is extensible um, at the smart contract level. And that's what we're hoping to achieve with uh, CryptoKitties on flow. Um, so over the next few weeks, we'll be showing folks the, the smart contracts and, and showing that, look, this is, a, this is a way for an ecosystem to emerge at the smart contract level. And of course, sort of at higher levels with user generated content, et cetera. And then the ultimate expression is I think sort of that metaverse world, right? Where anybody can come create anything, uh, interact with anybody else uh, in, a, in a purely open world um, obviously, the metaverses of, of today are, are great in, uh, in terms of Ethereum, are a huge improvement on, you know, what Minecraft and, and, and uh, all of these things are, are giving us in terms of um, at least ownership or, or control of the player. Um, but I think there's, you know, again, with sort of high throughput blockchains and more, um, more tools for developers, I think we can even take that to the next level and, and have worlds where every single action, every single atom um, is available for anybody to to build on, to contribute to, to derive value from, um, and, and that's what I get super super excited about. Um. That's awesome, um, and I completely agree. I, and I like the kind of categorization you did there, and and kind of talking through some of the things you're excited about. Um, so sticking on this very positive note, and kind of. Uh, what we're kind of excited about and you kind of alluded to it there with uh, NBA Top Shot which is a really cool project that hopefully should be out uh, by the time this is out um, I would love for you guys to maybe talk about some you know specific projects uh, like Roham just did about around your particular companies um, in terms of what you're excited about for the next couple of months maybe a year uh, and, and things, things, you're, things you're currently working on within the world of gaming uh, that you think people should know about this is your opportunity to kind of uh, tell the world about all the cool stuff you're excited about specific to your project uh, in the next couple of months. So again, we go Sebastian and then we go to uh, Rohan. Well, uh, of course, I'm going to preach for my own house first. <laughs> so I'm really excited about Sandbox, uh, like uh, finally coming out of markets uh, this year. We'll have the public beta for uh, players by December 2020. We have already released the alpha version of our game maker and Every day, every morning when I wake up, I can see all the amazing content, amazing world that's been made by this uh, exciting community of uh, creators. Uh, and, and this really, uh, like, I'm really thrilled to see all this creativity, all of this that uh, they are building and soon will be playable by thousands and more uh, users. That's really exciting. I guess also I'm pretty excited by the fact that we've now sold for over $1 million worth of lands. And there's still a lot of demand around it. Thank you. Thank you so much to all our landowners. They are part of our community. They are our best ambassadors and supporters. So it's amazing to be in that space and having such a large community supporting it as well. I'm uh, excited by all the partners we have, including DabberLab, CryptoKitties, uh, big brands like Atari, Rollercoaster Tycoon, Sean the Ship, and soon we'll announce also larger uh, game companies who are, are going to build the first experience on Sandbox platform. So all of that is coming uh, really soon uh, and uh, we'll be able to see that. Now on the other project that's coming to market, I'm also really excited about. I think 2020 and 2021 are going to be excellent year for gaming, blockchain gaming, specifically as we have great, great looking games that use blockchain technologies that finally coming in beta to the market. So. By them, uh, obviously, uh, I'm thinking about Gods and Chain, for example. I'm speaking about uh, Skyweaver by Horizon Games or uh, Blankos by Mythical Games. Those are games that 
well, when you just look at the trailer, when you see them, you, you, you want to play them. Like they, they, by any definition, any standards, they are on par with what traditional uh, PC or mobile game look like in 2020 and you like to play them. So that's exciting. I'm also very excited, of course. Uh, I've been always uh, uh, early tester in all the um, Dabralat products from CryptoKitties, from Cheese Wizard. I, I bought among the first uh, uh, Wizard there, and, and I'm I'm surprised I'm not yet testing NBA Top Shot, even though I I'm keep hearing here and there that everything is going so well with the first test. So, so I will write Ro I'm right after, and I say, oh, wow, look, I, I want to try out. And uh, yeah, in general, uh, I'm also the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance, which uh, gives me the chance to have an overview of what all uh, actors in the ecosystem are building and, and when they are going to launch their product. So even though I cannot name all of them, it's quite exciting to see uh, the quality of the project behind uh, and also the interest of traditional games company. Like we have members like Atari, Square Enix, we have AMD, Ubisoft, etc., which uh, shows us a strong interest from even larger gaming companies uh, to, to, to understand blockchain, to promote blockchain, and potentially to integrate blockchain as well as part of their future games. That is fantastic and a very exciting future to look forward to, my friend. Um, and I wish you all the best of luck with all the product launches and the collaborations you'll be Thank having you. uh, in the future. That's awesome. Uh, Roham, it's, it's up to you, man. Well, I'm very excited about Sandbox too, so so I better get my my early invite. Uh, and your NBA invite is coming, Sebastian. We've just been uh, I take a phone that, but we've been we've been uh, selling out and servers melting down, even with the the little group that we've been we we, we let in first. So so your 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 invite's coming. Um, on our end, I mean, you know, the the biggest thing I'm excited about is just getting people to come in and check out what we built. Um, you know, we, we, we created Flow completely from the ground up, new blockchain, new uh, architecture, a new programming language, lots of little changes that should feel very natural to most developers. Um, um, to Ethereum developers, it should feel like, you know, things that you felt were, were missing are, are actually there. Um, and and uh, we built Cadence, a new programming language, um, uh, inspired by uh, linear types and, and sort of trying to make smart contract writing much simpler, much easier, much safer, much more secure. So uh, whether you have tried Solidity or you, you thought smart contract development was a super complicated thing that nobody can do, go to play.onflow.org and, and, and start playing around with the playground. Um, I think it'll Im immediately be clear that, that holy, holy this, is, this is much, much simpler. Um, we built a payments uh, and on-ramps ecosystem um, not just our own products, but some with some fantastic partners that I think are going to make life for developers a lot easier. Um, and it's the applications that people just want to, you know, we built them as sort of flagship things that we want to demonstrate what's possible on our platforms is by no means sort of everything that's going to be on the platform, but um, it's kind of a guarantee that, look, we're bringing the users, you, the developers, come build the apps. Um, and, and, you know, I, the, the, the partners that are public are, you know, NBA, UFC, Warner Music, um, uh, Ubisoft as well, and, and some some big fish we haven't we haven't announced yet. But the the criteria for us is just people that want to build something that's real and authentic um, to their brand, but also to to crypto and, and that the promise of decentralization long term. Um, and and just want to kind of add like one I guess piece of advice or, or sort of you know the, the the one learning I've had from you know from crypto kitties to now is that short term. The one thing you don't, you shouldn't compromise on is user experience. And I think Sebastian hit, hit the nail on the head there. Um, and then, and, but long-term, the thing you don't want to compromise on is decentralization and openness. Um, because otherwise, why, why are you, why are you doing this in the first place? So, so I think like, if I can give that advice to folks building on flow, those are the kinds of folks that we're also trying to guide around. Look, first you got to build something that people want. It's got to be sustainable. Um, and then, and then you sort of turn the keys over to to the community. Um, and I'm really excited about the teams that are doing that, um, even on Ethereum and DeFi. Uh, and, uh, and it's really just cool to see the whole space evolve. It is indeed. It is indeed. And just to kind of uh, echo some of the things you said there, um, anyone who hasn't tried uh, playing around with the Flow play Playground or the Cadence programming language, um, after I did the interview with Roham, I went to check it out, and it is insane. Like I've 
written smart contracts in Solidity and I've also tried it with Flow, uh, using the Flow Playground and uh, Cadence. Way easier. <laughs> so um, definitely, definitely go check that out. That's awesome. Um, I'm interested to hear more about this uh, on-ramp as well that you mentioned. That was the first time I heard about that um, and I'm quite keen to hear more about that. That sounds like a, a pretty cool thing that you guys are working on and definitely needed uh, in the ecosystem. Um, but I am getting a message saying that the time is up. <laughs> I would honestly love to continue chatting with you guys. I think you're both fantastic and doing amazing work in the space. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing how your projects develop. Uh, but for now, I want to say a big, big thank you to both of you for coming to the show and uh, sharing all your cool stuff around all the cool projects and your ideas in the space. So big, big shout out to you, both of you guys. Yeah, thank you for having us.